I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space! Welcome to God is Open. I'm your host, Christopher Fisher. Today on God is Open, we are going to be critiquing the Molinist view of the world, the Molinist model. You know, they always claim that everyone else is doing the modal fallacy, the modal fallacy. We'll see if that is in fact true or if they themselves are not understanding the arguments. As always, we will use William Lane Craig as our model Molinist, the individual who represents his, his definitions are the ones that we are going to be using. So we need to actually let the Molinists define their own terms in their own words. Because one thing we need to do when we're critiquing someone's model is we need to put ourselves into that model. We don't have to agree with the model. If you're critiquing someone's internal logic, you don't have to agree with their logic. You don't have to import your views of the world. You just use what they state, what they set out, and see if they logically contradict, to see if there's there's any coherence to their beliefs among their other beliefs, if, if their definitions hold, if it's uh, um, internally inconsistent, if there's in, incongruent ideas that they hold at uh, simultaneous times, that's when you figure out if a model is internally sound. So critiquing Molinism does not suggest that I accept any of their categories of thinking. It doesn't doesn't suggest that I accept any of their definitions or that I think that anything they're talking about has any connection to reality really. So you are putting yourself into someone else's model to critique it. So that's why it's very important to let them define their own terms in their own words. Look at this. This is Reasonable Faith. This is William Lane Craig. This is an interview in which he describes what omniscience means. So omniscience is our first term that we're going to have to define. He says this, right, when we say to know everything, what we mean, this is omniscience, what we mean is knowing all truths, knowing all true propositions and believing no false propositions. If God doesn't have this attribute, he is not omniscient per the Molinist definition. So just keep this in mind. If God does not know the truth value of all propositions, and in William Lane Craig's mind, elsewhere he argues that all future events have a truth proposition. If God doesn't have all of these truth propositions known in his mind, he is not omniscient. The next term we need to define is a necessary truth or a necessary proposition. And for that, again, we'll turn to William Lane Craig. He states this, statements which could not have had a different truth value than the one they have are said to be necessarily true or necessarily false. So something that could not have had a different truth value. That's important. So if we find a proposition which could not, could not have a different truth value, then that is a necessary truth or a necessary falsehood. Keep that in mind. Likewise, there, there are possible truths, and these are statements which could have been true, uh, but could have also been false. And he throws out examples, and he uses some leading language. He says, obviously, these, these situations are examples. Like you flip a coin or something, and uh, obviously, it could have been heads or tales. Well, not so obvious when we're dealing with is the world faded or not. We can't be assuming our conclusions. So you have to take a look at the event and then wonder, well, what in, in, in this model that we're looking at in Molinism and, and we're looking at this event, does this event meet uh, possible truth or does it meet the definition of necessary truth? And uh, you have to look at the definitions of the words. You just don't assign adjectives willy nilly to them based on what you feel is true. Yeah, the feelings, the feelings don't have anything to do with it. You have to remain consistent to your model. So remain consistent to your definitions. If there's an event or if there's a statement, if there's a proposition which could not have been otherwise, um, then it's necessarily true or necessarily false. William Lane Craig's definition. And the last distinction that William Lane Craig makes that's important for this discussion is fate and determinism in the William Lane Craig model. Fate is something that uh, even God can't escape. It's, it's something that uh, is all events are necessarily true from all eternity. 
uh, that's fate. And he defines determinism as something different, like, for example, we're robots, and just the way the world was initially started, and then there's uh, everything compounds based on what's already started, and it's 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 uh, deterministic. Whereas there's there's no free will, there's no choice, there's no way things could be other than what this rolling snowball that's accumulating has started. No other no no other thing can happen other than that. So determinism is important as well because. Things might not be uh, all necessarily true, all these truth values of all these future propositions. The world m might not have uh, necessary truths, but we still might be under a model of determinism. So that's something we have to wrestle with as well. If God could change the future and uh, God doesn't, are, are we just robots that are fated to do whatever we do based on nothing in ourselves, no free will? Are we just input-output robots based on the, the data that we accumulate? If this data is inputted into us, this result will occur. That's determinism. No free will. So looking at these definitions again, uh, something that's necessarily true could not have been different. God's omniscience is knowing all true propositions and no false propositions eternally. He can't, he can't gain this knowledge. There's not a time where he doesn't know all future propositions and then he learns and gains new knowledge to himself that that uh, now he's learning. Uh, William Lane Craig doesn't like the idea of learning from some of his interviews. He, God can't gain knowledge. And of course, lastly, knowledge in, in this uh, scenario is going to be defined as holding a belief that's consistent with the truth value of the proposition. So if I believe that there is a red car, and uh, that car must exist because I have knowledge of it. If that car didn't exist, I wouldn't have, quote unquote, knowledge of it. So God's knowledge that's eternal, ungenerated, uh, that he decides in himself, um, that doesn't come to him from anywhere, that's eternal with God, he, he knows all future propositions, the truth value of those things. The question is, could could those type of propositions have been otherwise? Not necessarily that the knowledge causes it. Uh, let's put that out there right now. Uh, never have I ever said that that knowledge causes the event to happen. But what is true is that the content of our knowledge can't precede the truth value of that knowledge. Like for me to know that that red car exists, that red car has to exist. I don't have to know that that red car exists to make that red car exist, but the red car existing has to be equal to or prior to my knowledge of that red car existing. It's always funny when you're talking to Molinists. I mean, like these arguments that I'm making here are kryptonite to them, so much so that they hallucinate. Anytime I'm talking to them, they say, well, you're arguing that the knowledge causes the event. That is absolutely not what I'm arguing. In fact, I have explicitly time and time again in these very conversations with these people stated it's not the knowledge necessarily that causes the event, but the knowledge tells us about the event's existence. For example, if there is a red car, my knowledge that there is a red car, the fact that I have knowledge of that tells us that there is a red car. My knowledge doesn't cause the red car. The red car doesn't spawn into the existence because I know it's there. But what is true is that that red car's existence is as contingent or less than my knowledge of that car. Maybe that car is a necessary car. That car has to be here from all eternity. It uh, doesn't matter. My knowledge of that car, that necessary car, could exist, doesn't have to exist. Uh, my my knowledge is is not, is contingent, whereas the truth of that is has to be as contingent as my knowledge or less. In other words, that truth value has to exist before or at, arise at the same time as my knowledge of that truth. Per the definition of knowledge, is uh, knowing something that correlates to reality, uh, knowing a proposition as true, which is true. And God's omniscience is knowing all true propositions.
So in this model that we set out, God's knowledge of these propositions, those propositions are as contingent as God's knowledge and either exists simultaneously as his knowledge or precedes his knowledge. But this causes a pretty astute problem to William Lane Craig's model of omniscience, where God cannot not be omniscient. God cannot not be omniscient. God has to be omniscient. God can't be gaining new knowledge unto himself. God can't not have the knowledge and then get the knowledge. God's knowledge is not really contingent. It, it can't be other than what it is. There's no possible scenario in which it can be actualized, his knowledge being different than what his knowledge is. There's no other world that could have possibly come into existence than the one that there is now. Of course, he will say otherwise. He'll say, oh, there's all these possibilities. Well, that's the same thing as saying that uh, my knowledge that this red car exists, oh, that red car doesn't need to exist. Well, yeah, we, we know it exists because my knowledge of that car is true in the hypothetical we're setting up. I know that there's a red car. That means there is a red car. Well, the car doesn't have to exist. What? Now, mm, it's in the definition. It's in the definition of what we're talking about. So we just go look at our definitions, then we look at the car, and we know that that car has to exist based on the true fact that I know there is a red car. God's eternal omniscience, which is knowledge that doesn't get gained unto him, uh, he's not uh, ignorant and then becomes knowledgeable in Molinism. God always has this knowledge, and this is knowledge of events that themselves have to be as contingent as God's knowledge or less. So you're left with eternal truths that in what situation, in what situation could they have been otherwise than what they are? What, what's the possibility? Throw a percentage on it. Is it a 1% chance that they could have been different? Well, then that violates William Lane Craig's definition of omniscience. That violates his idea of what God knows, the truth value of these propositions, it can't be false. God can't believe something that turns out to be false in this model. There is 0% chance that these events would have been anything other than what they are. These are, of course, looking at definitions. Let's go look at his definition again of a necessary truth. Statements which could not have had a different truth value than the one they have. Huh, huh. So, so does William Lane Craig get away with saying, well, that red car didn't have to exist? No, you, you look at it, you say, well, God's knowledge of that red car is eternal. Uh, God has always known that red car will exist. There's no point in, of time in which God didn't know that red car would exist. That truth value either precedes the knowledge or is generated with this knowledge, but the knowledge isn't generated. Uh, there might be logical priorities, but guess what trumps the logical priority? William Lane Craig likes to do this. He wants to set up a logical priority in God's knowledge. Uh, guess what has to precede that logical priority knowledge of the future event? That future event's truth value has to precede or equal God's knowledge of the event. That future event is as contingent as God's knowledge. And remember, God's knowledge is eternal. It's ungenerated. It doesn't get gained to God. It, there's no point in time in which that knowledge is not true. In what possible world could it have been different? That sounds to me like a necessary truth. That must be true. There is no possible scenario in Molinism in which it's other than existing. So Molinists don't like their own definitions. They, they don't like following the logical conclusions of their own beliefs. They don't like, you, you ask them, in, in, give me a situation in which uh, this could actualize uh, that this red car doesn't exist. Give me a situation in which God does create a different world. Well, because then you have a situation in which God's knowledge of the future can be falsified. God can do other than what he eternally foreknows that he's going to do. Um, then it's not knowledge, is it? So you, it's, it's one or the other. These are mutually exclusive concepts. Omniscience, uh, the classical definition of omniscience, and a contingent future. These are mutually exclusive. You can't have one 
and the other. You got to pick one. Pick one and not both because they contradict. If something's eternally true, that means it cannot be false. That means it meets the definition that we have here per William Lane Craig, his definition of a necessary truth. That meets the definition of a necessary truth. The Molinist cannot special plead. They're not allowed to change their definitions. They're not able to just argue reality into existence like there's a red car and you say oh there's a red car and they say yeah and then you say but over here you said it doesn't exist oh yeah it doesn't exist um no then you're you're building contradictions into your model the, the, these two things are not congruent you're creating a model with internal inconsistency you're not holding your definitions consistent you can't just say that your model's not contradictory. It doesn't work like that. A proposition holding an eternal truth value, which cannot be falsified, it can't be changed, it, it must, a must, and William Lane Craig uses the the word must in some of his, uh, his interviews. He says, well, so, something must happen, but that doesn't mean it necessarily happens. Well, with eternal foreknowledge, it eternally must happen so you got zero scenarios in which it doesn't happen. So then it does meet the definition of a necessary event. Again, it's not the knowledge causing the event to happen, but the knowledge of that tells us that that exists and those properties exist in that object of knowledge. My knowledge of that red car doesn't uh, cause the red car to exist, but we do know something about that car that it is red because I have knowledge and knowledge of course is defined as my beliefs lining up with reality my 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 belief of a proposition re lining up with the reality of that proposition we know that that red car exists if in fact I have knowledge of that red car if God has eternal knowledge of a truth proposition of an event we know that that event has an eternal truth and value it cannot cannot be other than what it is it's a necessary truth by their own definition the mode of fallacy falls apart they don't understand their own arguments so a quick recap omniscience is god's future eternal knowledge of all truth propositions a necessary event is an event which cannot be other than what it is and uh, these truth propositions that god knows are eternal truth propositions which must, must occur exactly as he knows it from eternity. There's, there's no situation or scenario in which they do not occur because these are eternal truths. These, these are eternal because God's knowledge of it is eternal, which tells us about the properties of these events that God knows. Because the contingency of an event is as contingent as as the knowledge or less my contingent knowledge can be of something that's a necessary truth my knowledge doesn't matter my knowledge is secondary to the truth of that value so back to our second rule propositions are only as contingent as the knowledge of them or less I can know fatalistic things my knowledge doesn't matter my knowledge is secondary but I cannot know things that don't exist. My knowledge of an event means that that event exists. My knowledge of an eternal proposition means that that proposition is eternal. William Lane Craig, of course, has heard these counter arguments, and here's how he responds in typical Molinist fashion. Absolutely, fatalists will say to a man, we're not saying that God's knowledge of the future casually determines how the future will be, that is what the infallible barometer was meant to illustrate and going on. But they will claim that simply by virtue of knowing what they will be, that somehow makes them necessary. No, 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 it's not about making them necessary. God's knowledge can only be as contingent as the object that it knows. And if God's knowledge is eternal, that means whatever he knows is as eternal or more than his knowledge. That, that's how knowledge works, per your own definitions in Molinism. Not that I accept Molinism, not that I accept any of your definitions, not that I think this is a rational, logical system, but per your own system, per your own definitions, this is how reality works.
William Lane Craig then goes on to critique determinism. He says, oh, my critics, they're really talking about determinism, which means that God set the ball rolling and then everything must happen and we're all input-output robots. And here's how he responds to that. So this is a secondary problem with Molinism. Even if you get over the problem of all events being necessary events, which is a really real problem for Molinism, all events are necessary events per their own definition. Uh, they then have to get over the next hurdle of all events being deterministic and man having no free will, that we're just input-output robots. You put the right inputs into us and you'll get the exact outputs, that we're not thinking, breathing, free will creatures at all. We're just a product of our environment. And here's how William Lane Craig responds. And that would only be true if the world is casually deterministic. If it is an indeterministic world that God has actualized, then God has actualized the world, so to speak, up to the point of decision. And then it can either go X or Y. And it is up to the free agent which world would become actual. In that sense, we are coactualizers of the world along with God. But are we? Are we? God gives us the freedom to determine which world will be possible. Really? Because how? How, how does that work? That uh, God's able to foreknow all these events because he, he started the ball rolling in a certain way. And then everything must, must happen. How are we free agents? How are we not just input-output robot? You give us a series of inputs and the exact same output will happen with any same series of inputs in the same environment. You repeat that experiment 20 different times, you're going to get the same result each time because we're the products of our environment. Remember, what God foreknows we do, we must do. And God has foreknown this from before we were born, before we even existed, that our events of our life have been planned out, are known, and must come true without us even being in the picture. We're not in the picture. What you cannot escape is God's knowing which way you will choose. He knows which world is actual and will be actualized by your choice, but that doesn't determine it. Oh yeah, so if I program a robot and it's an input-output robot and then I start the ball rolling, let's say like I give it a series of numbers and then I let the, the series of numbers uh, gradually increase and, and then I'm not even touching those numbers anymore, but because I program that robot, I know what that robot out, robot's output is going to be. And based on the series of numbers that's actually going to get inputted into it, I know eventually, even though I'm not directly involved, there's there's this aura of, of separation that's that doesn't actually exist in this scenario. Because really, we are input-output robots in Molinism. So both determinism is true in Molinism, and all events are true necessary events. Us having free will is an illusion. It, it doesn't actually exist. We will make the same choice with the same inputs in the same situation, in any situation, uh, without fail, those choices which are foreknown from before we even existed, before we even were there to make any conscious decision. Our ideas that we are making a choice in Molinism is an illusion. Let's go back to William Lane Craig and look how he argues. He says, some statements just happen to be true, but obviously could have been false. And he gives examples. Garen DeWeese teaches at Talbot School of Theology. He says, obviously that's necessarily true. Obviously that's not a necessary event. But but really, really, that that's the question at stake. And you just saying that it's obvious that's that's an illusion in your system. That's an illusion in your model. Garrett DeWeese cannot not teach at that school of theology. There's, there's no world which could be actualized. There's no probability of any other world ever being actualized. Even if we could pretend in our mind, we could like think, oh, I could see him teaching at a different school in my mind. That's an illusion. In Molinism, there is no choice but for that to happen. Eternally, that truth proposition has been set and it must come true without fail. There's no other world that's possible. You can think of it this way. Uh, what percent possibility do those other worlds have of actualizing? If it's zero, it's not possible. By definition, if something has a zero percent chance of happening, 
It's not possible. Not possible. If eternally it has had a 0% chance of happening, then that makes it necessarily false per their definitions. Anyways, I'm not very impressed with Molinists. Molinists seem to be almost worse than Calvinists when you start talking about these issues. Uh, they will never, ever, ever, never represent you correctly. They will never address your actual arguments. They'll pretend you're arguing something that you're not arguing. Every single time they say, you're arguing that God's knowledge causes that event to be deterministic or fatalistic or a necessary truth. I've, I've literally, every single time I've dealt with these guys, said that's not what I'm saying. Listen to my actual arguments. And every single time they will represent me as saying that it's that knowledge that causes that truth. No, that knowledge tells us something about that truth which could have pre-existed or is as contingent as that knowledge. Knowledge tells us about truth. Truth doesn't tell us about anything about knowledge. Uh, that's an unrelated concept. And your idea of omniscience that you impose onto this knowledge, that's where your issues come in. That's where your worldview doesn't make sense. It doesn't jive. There's no internal consistency. And you have to give up one or the other. You have to give up either eternal foreknowledge of all events or that all events are necessarily true or false. They're incompatible. Anyways, any comments, questions, throw them down in the YouTube uh, comments section. Start a thread on the God is Open page. Thank you for listening.